Well, the world right now is seeing the realities of the brokenness from the curse of sin that we're under. Death and disease. It's a fun way to start an Easter sermon, right? That's the reality. That's what we live in. We live in a broken world. Even, even in our own lives, our, our personal lives, we see our own brokenness. It's one of these things that we don't really want to face up with the realities of much. We kind of want to gloss over this stuff. But suddenly you get quarantined in your house for a couple weeks. You find yourself getting irritated with people that you love dearly. And you find yourself being exposed to your own brokenness. Maybe it was one of these things this week where you just blow, blew up at your kids, right? You're trying to get your work done. You're trying to figure out how to do all this video conferencing. And your kids come into the room and they're, you know, he keeps poking me and I'm like, stop it, get along now. You know? and, and you realize, ah, oh, I just blew up at them. find ourselves confronted with the reality of our own brokenness in a broken world. But God, in his great love for us, entered into our broken world. That's what Easter is all about. We started off celebrating with Christmas, God Emmanuel, God with us. And Easter is the culmination now. That God is not just with us, but who he has redeemed us. So our broken world needs the reality of the resurrection. See, the historical resurrection, it supplants opinion. We have opinions on everything, right? Uh, I mean, we love espousing our opinions on life, and hobbies, and TV, you name it. Uh, if you've ever seen two people get in an argument over music, damn, it's a weird thing, like why, why are we fighting over this? The resurrection is one of these things that a lot of people have opinions over. Um, you know, what, was, was this something that really happened? Was it, was it something that, you know, as time went on, these followers kind of looked back and, and said, you know, this is, they felt like Jesus was alive with them. And so they came up with these stories and these legends that represent a higher truth of hope. But that's not how the Bible is written. That's not how scripture is written. It's not written as a, a legend. It's eyewitness accounts of history and facts that happened. Take, for example, the women that Jesus appeared to um, in Luke 24, 9 through 10. It says, returning from the tomb, they reported all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary, the mother of James and the other women with them were telling the apostles these things. If you're, if you're writing a legend, these are not the people to put as the focus of the first witnesses. Women at that time had a very low standing in, in the cultures. Uh, even in, in both Jewish and Roman courts of law, women really, the, the, their, their testimonies weren't admissible. They really weren't of value. And so why on earth would, if you're, if you're trying to you know, write a great story, would you use the, uh, uh, the eyewitness accounts of people that no one would really believe. So why on earth would, would Luke put this into his gospel? It's because they really saw this. They were really there. There's no motivation aside from that, partly because these witnesses were alive when the gospels were written, right? They were there to verify, say, no, that didn't really happen. Uh, it's fascinating how Luke actually, he's like, I'm naming names. They're out there. Go find them. Go talk to them. This isn't a secret. Another thing we see is that they are worshiping. They're worshiping Jesus. 
in Luke 24, 52, says, after worshiping him, they returned to Jerusalem with great joy. After worshiping him. Now for us, we look at, yeah, well, of course they're worshiping Jesus. No, no, this, this is a huge, huge statement because the Jews are the last people and the last culture that is ever going to worship a human as God. Not going to happen. Uh, that is the furthest thing from their worldview. So for them to freely admit, hey, we were worshiping Jesus. That's not something that's going to happen. Unless the resurrection is true. Unless they really were eyewitnesses to see that this person was dead and they are alive. The resurrection was inconvenient. It was, it was troublesome because this is a worldview changing event. This is not something that was preached as a higher symbol of truth. Like we, we have to always hang on to hope. That's not how it was preached. It was, it was preached as, as bare fact as a reality that, that is horribly inconvenient and impossible to dismiss. Uh, facts are like that, right? I mean, facts are often things that we really aren't too happy about. Uh, the fact that, you know, I'm sitting here recording a sermon instead of being with all of you, that bums me out. Uh, the, the fact that there are people sick and dying from this disease it's horrible that we're all stuck in our homes, that, um, that we're, we're being uh, forced to deal with now economy that's, that's starting to, to suffer, people losing jobs. But it's a fact. It's irritable. It's troublesome. And our culture, eh, our culture really doesn't like facts. We really don't. We, we have opinions and we have feelings. That's what we're really into, like likes and dislikes. Uh, the fact that you can go and look at this video on YouTube and you can thumb up it or you can thumb down it. The buttons are there. It doesn't matter what facts are for a lot of people. It's, it's, it's how I feel about things. It's my opinions. And so for the re resurrection to be a fact, that's something you have to deal with. And so <laughs> there, are, there are a lot of people that looked at Christianity and were offended by it. You look at Paul, he was offended by Christianity. Uh, so, you know, as a rabbi, as a, as a Pharisee, he's, he's going, okay, so wait a minute, you're, you're telling me there's, there's no need for the temple. Well, you're, you're telling me that we have no more need for sacrifices for our sins. That's outrageous. I don't think so. This is offensive. But when he sees the risen Jesus, here's the reality. My likes and my dislikes, they, they don't apply anymore. What Paul didn't like about Christianity uh, or the parts that seemed offensive didn't matter anymore because it is a fact. Here is the risen Lord. And this is one of these things where you know, lots of things in the Bible are offensive to people. Uh, it's, that's nothing new. Uh, with our culture right now, there are lots of things in scripture that, that just seem offensive to people, whether it's the morals or, you know, what it teaches about morals or sex or how to live or whatever. It's just, ah, I don't like that. But none of that actually has anything to do with the risen Jesus. It has nothing to do with whether Jesus raised from the dead or not. But realizing that Jesus rose from the dead it suddenly makes all that other stuff begin to make sense. Because it takes those things that are easy for us to turn into just arguments or opinions 
and frames them under the reality of who God is and how God has laid out his guidelines for humanity. In fact, Paul was so offended that he sought out and killed Christians. Uh, I, I know a lot of people that feel offended by things in Christianity, but I don't know too many people. In fact, I don't know anybody personally that's ever thought, I would like to go out and hunt and kill Christians because I'm so offended by what they are teaching and believe. But that was Paul. <laughs> but once he saw Jesus raised, it didn't matter anymore. The historical resurrection is the starting point that brings context to all of life. See, the resurrection makes sense of the rest of Scripture. The funny thing is that Jesus told the disciples that all these things are going to happen. Scripture prophesied about these sorts of things. It prophesied about the coming Messiah. But somehow so many people just missed it. So we see here in, in Luke 24, we see in Luke 24 that the angels are having to remind the women that Jesus told you about this stuff, right? Luke 24, six through eight. He is not here, but he has risen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee saying, it is necessary that the son of man be betrayed into the hands of sinful men, be crucified and rise on the third day. And they remembered his words. Ah, that's right. Yeah, you think someone would remember being told something like that. But oftentimes we hear things and it just, it doesn't, it doesn't compute yet. Or we, we don't have the ability to connect the dots for some reason. Even later on in the same chapter on Jesus's way, uh, or excuse me, as there's um, some of the followers on their way to um, Emmaus, Jesus appears to them. They don't quite realize it's him yet, but he starts talking with them and, and there's, they're telling him in Luke 24, 20 through 21, our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be sentenced to death and they crucified him. But we were hoping that he was the one who was about to redeem Israel. And they're going, oh, we, we, we thought, we thought he was the one that was prophesied about, but then he died so we don't know what's going on. I don't know if you ever had that happen where like you think you got life figured out, think you got, great, I'm good to go. And then man, you get thrown a curveball. What a curveball when you think here, here is the one that God has promised. And you're seeing him do miracles and you're seeing him just blow your mind. This is clearly from God. And then he dies and it's over. But Jesus clues him in. In Luke 24, 25 through 27, he said to them, how foolish you are and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Wasn't it necessary for the Messiah to suffer these things and enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted for them the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. The resurrection makes the cross finally make sense. Because how can he be Messiah if he dies? Not only dies, but dies the worst of deaths. The kind of death that everyone, Jewish, Roman, we all know, this is a shameful death, dying on a cross. This is the death we reserve for the worst of our people. So clearly this person's not from God if this is how they end. The Jews, like Paul, I mean, are rightfully looking at how Jesus' life ends and go, yeah, Clearly, that is not our Messiah. Clearly, this is not the person 
that that God had promised. Because the Messiah, Messiah meaning anointed one, right? He's the chosen one. Well, clearly this guy was not chosen by God. He is not the anointed one. Because the anointed one would be blessed by God. Someone that God loves, someone that God is pleased with someone supported by God, someone accompanied by God. And yet the proof is in the pudding, right? You look at, no, that obviously, obviously this person is not loved by God, um, not blessed by God. Oh my goodness. I mean, even Jesus said, right? As Jesus is dying, he says in Matthew 27, 46, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? And so for someone like Paul looking at this going, how, how on earth is salvation coming from this? But then Jesus raised from the dead. Paul suddenly has to reevaluate. People have to suddenly reevaluate that were eyewitnesses to this and going, okay, um, wait a minute. If, if he raised from the dead, uh, clearly God has vindicated him. God is pleased with him. Uh, God does love him and has blessed him. Okay. So, so if he was cursed and abandoned, it, it must have been cursed and abandoned for someone else's sin, not his own. Okay, that changes things. See, suddenly now, Scripture starts to make sense where sometimes you look and you go, wait, why? How? Uh, for example, uh, you look at <clears throat> the book of Isaiah when, when he's talking about the coming Messiah as king. But then also he's the suffering servant. Okay, well, how, how is this the same person? How is this the same figure? Um, you start looking at things like, okay, the, does the blood of bulls and goats and little lambs, does that absolutely make up for sin and cover over sin for all time? What if all of it was pointing to something or someone? In Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34, look, the days are coming. This is the Lord's declaration. When I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, this one will not be like the covenant I made with the ancestors on the day I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant that they broke even though I am their master. The Lord's declaration. Instead, this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days. The Lord's declaration. I will put my teaching with them and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will one teach his neighbor or his brother saying, know the Lord, for they will all know me from the least to the greatest of them. This is the Lord's declaration. For I will forgive their iniquity and never again remember their sin. Or how about God's promise to Abraham that all the world would be blessed through his descendants. And Jesus starts going through all these things and starts explaining, like, it's all pointing to me. It's about me. Luke 24, 44 through 49 says, He told them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. He also said to them, this is what is written. The Messiah would suffer and rise from the dead the third day and repentance for forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name to all the nations. Beginning at Jerusalem, 
You are the witnesses of these things. The witnesses of what? The resurrection. It's fascinating reading the Old Testament in light of the resurrection. Because it it starts making things make sense. Whoa, this is pointing to Jesus. This is about Jesus. And so it's almost like having that karate kid moment. You know, when I was a kid watching Karate Kid, you know, the movie, right? Uh, There's that scene where he's wanting, Daniel's wanting to learn karate and Mr. Miyagi's telling him to go wax my cars and paint my fence. And, and they're going, why? What's the point of this? And so Daniel starts getting mad and he starts complaining to Mr. Miyagi. And I'm like, you're slave. And so Mr. Miyagi tells him to, to, you know, wax and to paint the fence, you know, wax on. And he, oh, and he Mr. Miyagi throws the punch and, oh, he blocked the punch. Oh, turns out he knows karate, right? You know, as a kid, you're like, what? That's amazing. You know, and then you go watch the movie again later and like you see the scenes where he's all frustrated, waxing the cars. You're like, it's okay, man. You don't even know. You're going to get crazy good skills doing that. You know, and all these kids suddenly want to go out and start painting their fence out in the backyard. Dad's going, what's going on out there? But you start looking at scripture from the realization, oh, oh, the resurrection, it happened. Here's the reality. So now we look back at certain verses and go, oh, okay, that makes sense now. I get it now. And the resurrection is a powerful message. It's a message to the whole world. Hey, the future is real. Yeah, I know. No, but a future after death. There is something more than just this life. I, you know, I I assume like me, you hear all sorts of interesting views of what it is like after death. The, I think the biggest one now is people that just go, well, there's nothing. There's nothing after death. I die and that's it. No more consciousness, no more nothing. I am food for the worms and that's it. Uh, There's also... I hear a lot of this sort of like, we, we go, we're with the stars now. You know, we return to the energy of the universe and, and these sorts of things. And, you know, it's like, well, but do you have a personality? Well, no, no, you, you, there's no more personality. There's nothing. You know, you're just, you're part of the cosmos again. Like, well, that doesn't sound too great. So is there anything? The resurrection shows the future is real. There is a future after death. The eyewitness of the resurrection shows that, hey, there is something. We are not just dust in the wind. We also see that the future is personal. It's not just real, but it's personal. I don't want to lose my personality after I die. What would be the point of that? How horrible if you lost who you are. Life, life is about people. It's about relationships. It's about love. So if we lost all that, what's the point of it? And this is partly what's so hard about death. Death takes uh, our loved ones away from us. Eventually, it'll take us away from our loved ones. How can there be any hope for the future if in death we're just sort of erased? We're just a new clean slate. We're something else. But the resurrection shows that Jesus returns as himself. Here he is, Luke 24, 39. Look at my hands and my feet, that is, I myself. Touch me and see, because a ghost does not have flesh and bones, as you can see I have. It's still Jesus. And he's like, hey, you guys got anything to eat? And he has a little bite. It's still Jesus. He didn't lose who he was. A personal future is that the only thing that really would satisfy 
the human heart because it's part of who we are. We also know that our future is certain in the sense that I can be certain that I have a future home in heaven. And that's one of the things we go, well, I don't, man, I don't know if God can really forgive me. Uh, you know, I don't know if it's one of these things where you get like nervous and you're like, well, I don't know. What if I mess up? Well, what, I mean, what if I really mess up? Like maybe God won't forgive me at that point. I, I don't, you know, and that's like, that's a real concern. You know, if you're one of those people that's, you know, you've, you've said the sinner's prayer like 10,000 times. Every time someone's like, who wants to become a Christian? You're like, well, I'm not hundred percent sure. So I better do it again. You know, there's this nervousness, like, well, I don't know. I don't know. But you can be certain of the promise of heaven because of the resurrection. Think of it this way. If someone goes to jail, they've got a a five-year sentence. They go to jail. When they get out after five years, the debt's been paid. The law has no more claim over their life for that crime. It's done. It's paid for. The sentence has been served. The punishment for sin is death. And so when Jesus went into death and came out of death, the price was paid. The empty grave means the debt of your sin has been paid. I don't know if you're a weirdo like me, but I get nervous anytime I'm, I'm about to exit a store and there's someone there that wants to check the receipt. I don't know if we may go to like Costco, Walmart's doing it now. You know, there's someone there that you're coming up to the door and they're like staring at you and you're like, eh, and, and they want to see your receipt. And you get kind of nervous, like, oh man, did I accidentally like put something in my car and I didn't realize, like, I don't know. I get this weird little anxiety, but it doesn't matter how I feel. Doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if I feel nervous or whatever. The fact is, they're going to look at the receipt and go, all right, you're fine. And I head out the door. The resurrection is this giant receipt stamped on history for all to see. You can know your future is certain if you believe in Jesus. The future is not only real and personal and something you can be certain of, but it is wonderful. What would be the point if it wasn't wonderful? Why on earth would we be excited about the resurrection if, if it's just more brokenness? How much time do we spend lamenting the past? You know, secretly stalking your old high school crush on Facebook or Instagram. You know, sitting around going, man, if coach had put me in fourth quarter, we would have won state. I would have gone pro, you know. As you get older, you spend a, a lot more time thinking about the things that you've lost. You know, your health is gone. Your youth is gone. Your friends are gone. Your kids are gone. Simplicity is gone. And you, you just start looking at more and more things that you've lost at some point. And man, that can just start to suck the life out of you. You just start like dying inside. And so a lot of religions that, that try and offer some sort of spiritual enlightenment or bliss it really isn't anything more than consolation for what's been lost. But the resurrection, the resurrection is a restoration of what was lost. Not only are you going to get your body back, but you're going to get the body back that you always wanted. I'm not going to have to deal with asthma anymore. I'll be able to breathe just fine you will not only get your life back, you'll get back the life that you you wanted. Maybe you're you're in this state where you're going, I thought I was gonna get married and I never did. 
It's probably never going to happen at this point. Or maybe you're looking at a lost marriage or a relationship. And, and what you feel is this lament for something that's lost. But make no mistake, there is going to be a wedding feast in heaven that you will be a part of. You have lost nothing. That is such an important thing to understand that the best is yet to come. All of this is based on the historical fact that Jesus rose from the dead. That we have hope and joy in a future to come. Because Jesus conquered death. Who wouldn't want that? Who wouldn't want a wonderful future? I mean, you can look at a lot of things and go, I don't know if I like that about Christianity. But, but who wouldn't want the wonderful future that Jesus offers? The reality is that Jesus is Messiah. Jesus is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. He is God in human flesh. He died, he rose again. He was the payment for our sins. He was the payment for your sins, for my sins. And it was to give us a hope and a future that right here, right now is not all there is. That there is an eternity that is real and personal. It's wonderful. Will you trust him? Will you trust him? Will you submit to him as king? King of your life. Whether you like or dislike what he's asking of you. It's a hard question, but you know what? The end result, I would say, is 100% worth it because he loves you. He loves you. He knows what's best for you. He loves you and loved you even when you were at your worst. And he wants to renew you and give you that hope and a future. And receiving that hope in a future is as easy as ABC. A, I admit, I admit that I'm broken, that I have sinned. B, I believe that Jesus died for my sins. For all those sins, he paid the price for it. And he rose from the dead. Because he didn't die for his sins. Because he didn't have sins. He died for my sins. And God is pleased with him. He is my risen savior. I believe that. And see, I'm committing my life to him. You are my king. And I'm following you. Man, what a great day this is. Easter. That we get to celebrate our risen king. Would you guys pray with me? Father God, thank you so much. Thank you so much for being our risen king. Thank you that the, the reality of the resurrection means that, that you are not just another person that claimed a lot of stuff and died and is gone. Thank you that you were the perfect sacrifice for our sins, that you were acceptable and pleasing to God. Thank you for redeeming us from our brokenness. And Lord, I just ask that you would give us just the faith to trust you. Even when we're struggling, that we would recognize that the resurrection was a reality. And even the things that we feel like we're not sure about yet, that we would fall back on that and realize that you know what you're doing and that we can trust you with our lives and our decisions. I pray that we would make decisions to follow you every day and to submit our, our wills to your will.
Thank you, Lord, for loving us and giving us a hope and a future. We pray in your name, Jesus. Amen. Have a great morning, Cornerstone.